Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is your. I don't know. I'm not sure. The name loud. Okay. This is your unit eight review. So reminding you of what we talked about. We talked about behavior, different aspects of behavior. We talked about ecology, population, community, and ecosystems. And then we just finished up today with conservation biology. So I thought we would start off with a population ecology question. And I'm going to go ahead and pause it, and then I'll give you an opportunity to work it out. OK, so let's write down what we know. What do we know? OK, n equals what? 20, OK? We know r equals b minus d, right? So what r equals, what would be the math there I would do? 0.48 minus, which equals what? 0.27. OK. Now, 20 bobcats introduced. We know its birth rate. We know its death rate. Give the initial bobcat population. So what would be the answer to the initial bobcat population? 20. Okay. Predict the population size after two years on the island. So we could do change in the population over a change in time of one year. What is one year? Well, how would I do it? What, what's the equation? NR. Yeah, R times N. Do I have any carrying capacity here? No. Why? I don't have one, right? Nobody gave me one, so I'm not going to include it. Okay? So what is R? 0.27. 0.27 times N, which is 20. What does that equal? 5.4, which is just 5. Okay, did you get 5.4? Yeah. So what I would do is that's the change in the population over time of 5.4. So my after year one, what is my population? 25.4. I wouldn't round till the end. Oh, okay. Round at the end. Okay? So now my n is equal to 25.4, right? So then I want to know the change in population after another year. It's r times n again. Guys, I can't talk over the top of you. I'm too tired. Has this part changed at all? No. No. So again, it's 0.27 times 25.4. What is that? 6.8. 6.8. So now I'm going to add 25. 0.4 to 6.8, and what'd you get? 32.2, so then you said 32. Got it? Yes? If it was a 32.6, they probably would take either one if it was something like that. Usually they're going to give you one where you don't have any iffies. But a lot of times, like the answer key that you already saw, I think they probably they said anything between like 41.4 and 41.6 or something. You know, like they would have you, they would have a range of what would be acceptable. Okay? Yes? Just to backtrack a semester, this would be founder's effect, right? Because you're introducing the oh, into it the could be, it could be an example of it. Yeah, because they were introduced to a barrier island to help control a large rodent population. Now, do you see how they could use something like this where they ask you what is the population in two years and then they could ask you a follow-up question like what could be the potential outcomes of the introduction, right? And then we could talk about some of the things we talked about today when you introduce a non-native species, right? And this was done purposefully, right? Okay, so that's that question. I apologize for the funky font. I copied and pasted from the list of essays, so but we'll just kind of talk through them. The first thing I asked you is define and explain the role of each of the following on behavior. So what's the role on behavior? So we have, you have a list of all these essays, don't forget, and it says it, unit eight. <laughs> um, nature versus nurture. So when we talk about behavior, nature versus nurture, we're saying, is it in our DNA? or is it in our environment? Do we have experiments to support that it's in our DNA? Yes. Give me an experiment to support that it's in my DNA. The birds. The nesting behavior of birds, short and long. Give me another example. What? Twins. Give me another example. The snake, snake tongue. Snake 
Oh yeah, Fosby, Gene, and Rats, and Mothering. So, no way. guys, I do not want to talk over the top of you, okay? So, those would all be examples that you could bring up as evidence that you would explain in a way to support that our behavior is determined by nature, it's in our DNA. The nurture part would be anything we do that helps with what? Learn learning, right? So what is it when it's not learned? It's just this does this. What do you call that? Fixed action, Fixed action pattern. Now, you're going to see in lower species, you're going to see a lot of fixed action patterns. This, this. We have this large cerebral cortex, which separates our behaviors and our motor pathways from our sensory pathways. And we have a lot of interesting dynamics, so we can change our behavior. So you're going to see less fixed action patterns as we increase in our brain size and brain folding, right? So fixed action pattern means there's no other way to do it. I will only do it in this way. And I gave you examples of fixed action patterns like regurgitating food, right? Uh, mother seagull regurgitating food for the baby if the baby pecks on her beak. Triggers for mating, right, were fixed action patterns. Response to the color red um, for fish. Um, spiders building a web, those kind of things are fixed action patterns. But when we talk about um, nurture, we're saying there's something in our environment that can help us or teach us to learn. And we can relate that to some of the things down here where it says associative learning, right? So something that changes our behavior due to our environment. Um, imprinting. What is imprinting? Why don't you pick the uh, dark-shirted bio buddy, tell the younger bio buddy. What is an example? No, no, I take it back. I take it back. Dark-shirted one, you explain what is imprinting, and light-shirted one, you give them an example of imprinting. If you don't have a hookup partner, have a fine one. Okay. You know what I mean. Give me two words. Give me three words to explain infant. Sensitive. Sensitive, period, learning. Right? Right, so when you can teach them something. We looked at lots of examples in birds. What was the man who did the experiment? Lorenz. Lorenz, on that, remember, and he would wag his face in front of them when they hatched, and they would follow him wherever he went. Salmon have olfactory imprinting, right, where they swim to their home stream. Um, we looked at a lot of different ones with bird song learning. Okay, types of associative learning. There were two big ones that I gave you. Operative and classical. classical. Okay, dark shirted one, you take classical, and light shirted one, you take operative. Which one was Skinner? Operative. Yeah. Yeah. So, for. for Perform this operation, right? Operant conditioning, and I and I will give you either a reward or if you do it poorly, a punishment. Okay, so that um, was getting some something that's going to follow up that particular behavior, and you're associating that follow up to maybe motivate you to do that behavior. Um, whereas classical, it was more a physiological response. And who do we think about for that one? Pavlov's dog. You're eliciting a behavior from them, you're getting them to salivate, or you're getting them to bark, or getting them to jump up and down, or whatever. Okay? Um, female choice versus male competition. What did we say on female choice? There were two hypotheses there for female choice. Good gene. And Good gene and runaway. Which one is, you're so handsome. Runaway hypothesis. Good gene is you have the resources to protect me or defend, you're the largest, something like that. Um, male competition. Um, is that inter or intra competition? Intra, within, within the male competition. Now, most of the times, any kind of competition like that is gonna involve some sort of confrontation. It could be a, a lethal, right? Or it could just be a dance. 
What you don't want to do is in the, end up destroying yourself, right? So number three comes in and gets all the babes because one and two fought a bloody fight, right? So there's different ways to do that. One, one thing to establish in male competition is territoriality. That is an area that you are what? Defend. Because you think it has better resources and females will want to come live with you because you have this nice territory. Altruism versus self-interest. Do you think, well, let's say a light-shirted bio buddy, you explain what is altruism? Altruism. All right, so tell me. Altruism is something that can what? Harm my fitness. Yeah. Fitness. <laughs> my fitness. Decreasing my fitness to increase the fitness of somebody else. Does it actually exist? No. 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 What looks like you're really being altruistic could be what? Skin selection. Right? Or all scratch your back. If you scratch Reciprocal. mine, what is that called? Reciprocal altruism. So it could be that you're looking out for your family, and that's why you're being altruistic. You're not standing up there decreasing your fitness and death for any other reason, not to be kind or loving, because then you would eliminate that gene, right? You would eliminate the kind, loving gene, because the kind, loving gene would be dead and not making any offspring. So you must be doing it for a reason. You must be selecting that trait because it actually increases your fitness, not decreases your fitness. Because you're looking at your indirect fitness for that. Forms of communication. What is one that's fast, that works in the night or in the day? Auditory. Right? Night or day. Fast. Um, what one it works primarily in the day? Visual. Visual. But it can work in the night. What one is, I peed a little. Chemical. Chemical, right? So, <laughs> thanks, Miss Litton. Um, uh, right? And then, what's the last one? Tactile. Tactile. What's classic one with tactile? Waggle dance. Waggle dance. Waggle dance. The waggle dance. Okay, um, this time, dark shirted one. Tell them what this dance means. You should know what this stands for. And tell the direction of the distance. Don't yell it, just tell your What do I need to draw right here? The sun, right? This would be the sun, and then this is the angle away from the sun on the vertical that I need to fly. So this line right here tells me the direction, direction. good. And these tell me the distance. distance, because then each waggle is representative of a certain distance that is species specific. Okay, and remember that we think most dances are you're watching, this time you what the dancer? Touch the dancer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was forms of communication. Are selected, K selected. Dark shirted one. Dark shirted one. You're going to go through these with R selected. Light shirted one. You're going to go through it with K selected. Um, ping pong back and forth. And then we'll check them together. I'm going to pause this just for a minute. Okay. First of all, um, tell me before we start in on those comparisons. What would um, like a bear be? K. 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 What is K referring to? Carrying capacity. Okay. Um, so what kind of growth model would a bear have? Logistic. Logistic, right? What kind of curve is that? S shape. And it starts to slow down as it reaches its carrying capacity, right? So something like a mayfly would be small and that would be R selected, right? Maximum R. High birth rate, low death rate. Good. What kind of, not too loud back there. What kind of growth, maybe not too loud back there. So what kind of growth model would that be? J-shaped. J-shaped. Exponential. What do both logistic and exponential growth curves have in common? 
A lag is exponential. Lag and exponential. Good. Okay. Um, did I hit? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, limiting factors. What kind of factors usually limit an R species? Uh, they usually crash and burn because they don't. They have crash and burn, but what is it usually? Abiotic. abiotic. Yeah, oftentimes it's abiotic. It's a short term when they can grow and multiply, a, a certain things in the environment. Whereas they are usually biotic for the what? Caseology. What's another name for the, each of those? Density independent and density dependent. Yes, density independent. Is that abiotic or biotic? Abiotic. Give me an example of a density independent factor. Tornadoes. Tornadoes. Floods. Salinity. A rock. <laughs> Floods. What is something that would be density dependent? Disease. Predation. Good. Okay. Um, life history patterns. What what is the, what are those two life history patterns? Opportunistic and equilibrium. Opportunistic is the R selected. It's like eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. So taking advantage of every opportunity. Um, they're great colonizers, whereas equilibrium, they're more about being competitors because they're competing for that particular spot, right, in order to survive. And then mortality patterns. What is that referring to? Uh, type 1, type 2, and type Yeah, what do we call those? Survivorship, Survivorship curves. There were three survivorship curves. Which one are you? Type, type, type one. one. Number one, so a big bear would be type one, which means of a thousand babies born, most survive, right? Type one, most survive, and then they die at the end of their lifespan. Type three is the other extreme, right? That's the R selective, where of a thousand babies born, most of them die off. Okay, and then type two is some other factor that's regular, like birds, and it usually falls in between there. All right, now, within communities, discuss the role and impact of competition. Okay, so this is within communities. This is different than competing within your population, right? This is not competing with another male of your same species to fertilize a female. This is competing two different species. Do you remember what we, guys, you're just too loud, because they can't hear me right here. There was something, a principle, what was it called? Competitive exclusion principle, which said no two species could occupy the same niche. What would be the outcome? One replaces the other. One replaces the other, one dies, or? They share. They share. What do you call that? Resource partitioning. Resource partitioning. What is an example of resource partitioning? You take the day and I take the night. Barnacles on the rocks, different species of birds or monkeys in the tree and the canopy and dividing it up, right? What? Yes, that's the word I wanted. Both of those words can lead to character displacement, which would really lead to evolution of a species, right? Okay. Um, Predator-prey dynamics. What did we say we saw in predator-prey dynamics? Cycling. Cycling. Predator number goes up, the prey number goes, yeah. and the prey number goes down, the? Predator. Yeah, and it could be solely an interaction of the predator and prey, but there could be something else, like a food source for the prey. If there's not enough grasses because there's a drought, the prey numbers are going down, not because they've been eaten too much, it's because they don't have enough food for themselves, so their numbers are going down, and as a result, so too will the predators. Um, symbiotic relationships. I'm, there are many different relationships. I was holding you to three. What were the three? What is it? It's, what could you say is true of all three relationships? It benefits one, one member. It benefits one. So if it's plus, plus? Uh, mutualism. Example? Bees and flowers. Bees and flowers are, are that's coevolution. I agree. The acacia tree and the ants, right? Okay. Plus, I don't care. Commensalism. Commensalism. Which what would be an example for that? What's the classic example for that? Epiphytes. They live up on top of trees. Epi above, right? Epiphytes. Phyto. I don't know. Okay, number three, good for me, bad for you, would be parasites. 
A tick, on a dog. tick on a dog. There you go. All right. Next. Um, briefly describe the following cycles, their importance, and man's impact on them. Water cycle. What do we call this? Transpiration. What do we call this? Transpiration. What do we call it if I'm a plant? It's Transpiration. Transpiration. What do I call it if the water is it underneath the rock underneath me? Groundwater, another name? Aquifer. What do we have to work out and look out for? In how how does man screw up the water cycle? Oh yeah. Uh, Pollute, remove it. Uh, yeah, you could have over enrichment of a body of water. Sinkholes. Sinkholes as a result of removing the water. Mining. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. All right. Um, carbon cycle. What are the words that come to mind? Photosynthesis. Now stop for a minute. When you think of the word, think about what it does to the carbon cycle. So photosynthesis takes removes carbon, carbon, right? In the gaseous environment, right? Um, what's another one? Cellular respiration generates carbon dioxide, right? What else? Combustion. Combustion generates carbon dioxide, right? And then what's the one we're going to link to that? Decomposition. Global warming, oh. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? Creating more of those gases. We're removing the trees, right? Maybe, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Nitrogen cycle. Ready? Where's the reservoir for nitrogen? In the air. So let's go. Um, let's go grab it. Here we go. Wait. Did I keep thinking I paused it? I didn't. Okay. Here we go. Be with me. Be with me. Nitrogen fixation by nitrogen fixing bacteria. What are we forming? N2 to what? Ammonia. Then we do nitrification first, nitrite, NO2 minus, then nitrate. Those are nitrifying bacteria. So they're starting with ammonia and converting it to nitrite and then nitrate. Nitrate, we can serve it on a tray up to plants and then animals can eat the plants and the plants and the animals who works on them breaking it back down into the ammonia okay there's another way to get nitrate atmospheric fixation industrial fixation how do we return this nitrate back out? Denitrifying bacteria. What is it? Denitrifying bacteria. Good job. Okay, phosphorus. Yes? Does atmospheric fixation go from nitrate to nitrate? Goes from N2 to nitrate. All at once. All at once, yeah. Okay, um, phosphorus. Where is the reservoir for phosphorus? Rocks. How does it get out of the rock? Normally, weathering erosion. weathering erosion, good. So we can increase its release, right, by mining. runoff, mining, right. Okay, and so runoff from like dairy farms, pollutants. What's the problem with that? It's usually a what factor? What do you call it? Limiting, Limiting factor. But when it gets into the environment, you can get a Algal bloom, which seems great because those are producers. Yay! But then they what? Who works on them? Decomposers. Decomposers do what process? Cellular respiration. So they take the out of the. So now the. There we go. <laughs> yes. So by limiting. I can't hear. Shh, go. So by limiting factor, does that mean it just affects the population and it? It like keeps it in check. There's a limiting factor to this room. My contract says I can only have 36 students in a classroom on average. So that's a limiting factor. That puts a brakes on how many sections I teach. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, next, um, describe the climate. So that's talking about what is climate referring to? Temperature and rainfall. It keeps blinking at me. Describe the climate, the flora. What is that? Plants, the fauna of the following biome. Now remember, we can get to the biomes by either moving, increasing in latitude, going from the equator and going towards the poles, or I can go up a mountain, altitude, right? 
So when I look at something like tundra, okay, what are the characteristics of tundra? Permafrost. Permafrost, okay, so that's a unique characteristic. What can you tell me about the climate? Little rainfall. Yeah, very little rainfall, and it's very cold. cold. Yeah, it's like mostly winter, and it is. It's a frozen desert. So you're going to have organisms that, that go there intermittently for very short amounts of time. What did you tell me about the soil? Did you use a word yet? Permafrost, permanently frozen soil. Okay, so now let's warm up a little bit. Let's warm up a little bit and move into what kind of forest? Coniferous forest. Now the very fact that it's a forest means we must have enough, but it's probably very, and we have needle-like leaves. Let's warm up a little bit. Now we're at a temperate deciduous forest. This has four seasons, Hansel and Gretel, more broadleaf trees, right? Um, um, tropical rainforest, we have a lot of rain, very broadleaf, huge amount of diversity. Um, grasslands, why are we grasslands? Right, not enough rain, okay? And then deserts, not even less. And it's what, really hot during the day and cold at night, perfect. Concerning biodiversity, describe different factors influencing biodiversity. So what were the three types of biodiversity we were looking for? Genetic, what am I making right now? DNA. Yeah, genetic biodiversity within our population. Then we also need community biodiversity. Make it, guys, make it make sense to you, right? population, I need lots of variations within my population. How am I gonna vary within my population? My DNA has to vary, right? Look around the room. Do we have variety in our DNA? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, then what? Community. Finish strong, please. Everybody's tired. Community diversity means we have lots of different species within our community. We don't have a narrow range, like one bird, one plant, one animal. We have a lot of different diversity. What's the third one? Landscape. Landscape and ecosystems, because we all have a lot of different factors for different organisms to live. Direct and indirect values of maintaining biodiversity. Mac and cheese, what's mac? Medicinal. Medicinal, agricultural, agricultural, agricultural and uh, consumption. consumption. Okay? Those are obvious to see. Indirect values, let's see if we can come up. I think there's six of them. Let's see if we can come up with them. Waste. Soil erosion. Waste. Waste okay, disposal. soil erosion, so we want to preserve the soil. Waste disposal. Waste disposal. Ecotourism. Ecotourism. Provision of fresh water. And then on that, I think just one class I mentioned on provision of fresh water, how much of the earth is fresh water? Three. And where is it located? In the glaciers. Yeah, where? Glaciers, which we are melting. And forests, which we are cutting down. Okay, just checking. What else? Uh, Climate regulation. Did you talk about? And biogeochemical. Remediation, biogeochemical cycles. Okay. All right. Next. Describe and give examples of the top four causes of extinction. What was number one? Habitat loss. And we're really worried about those coastal areas, right? Where you have my phone. And then what's the next one? Exotic species. Is alien species number two? Yeah. Yes. How do how do these alien species get to these areas? Aren't there areas? Aren't there barriers to keep them out? Humans bring them there. Roads and barriers. Yes, Sam. Let's remember, what are some of the broken barriers that we have? Pioneers bringing them. Accidental. Accidental. Agriculture. Agriculture and horticulture. Perfect. Okay? So they're getting to these areas. They don't have any natural predators, so there's too many of them. Yes? Would a broken barrier also be like the fracture? Um, no, because a fracture is going to keep you out. Okay. Yeah. So what's happening in these situations, they're brought to an area where they didn't evolve. So they evolved in an area where they had competition. And so whatever adaptations they have make them equipped to survive there. But there's always been something else that's been competing with them or eating or taking up their space, so they're in limited numbers. So you take them an area there and you bring them here, and then they outcompete against it or they don't have a, a predator. Okay. okay? 
All right. Um, so we did habitat loss. We did um, exotic species. What was the next one? Pollution. Pollution. And we talked about all different kinds of pollution. Let's see if we can remember some of the different types of pollution. Acid, rain. Acid, rain. Eutrophication. Eutrophication. Ozone, Ozone depletion. depletion. Global warming. Global warming. Uh, chemicals. 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 Good. All right. And then what was number four? No, that was number five. Over-exploitation. Over-exploitation. Over right? Remember about MVP, minimum viable population to survive, because we, we end up taking them out and it's a positive feedback and it can deplete their numbers to where it sends them down that vortex of death. All right? Um, give specific steps to preserve and restore habitats. If we're talking about preserving what we had, what are some things we said? Preserve the areas that are closest to the equator, the hot spots. What else did we say? Keystone species. Keystone species. What was our example of a keystone species? An otter. An otter. Yeah, sea otter who keeps the kelp beds high because he eats sea urchins. But who's eating the sea otter? The killer whale. Killer whale. Why is the killer whale eating the sea because otter? Because he doesn't have other food, right? Why doesn't he have other food? Because they don't have enough fish. Because we're doing overfishing and it's exploitation. Okay, so we said keystone species. We said hot spots, what else? Source Wave state. your flagship, flagship species, right? Okay, and then um, going back, remember we talked about metapopulation, source and sink, we wanna keep them in the source, and then on restoring, return them to their natural cycles, let's say they have a weathering and rainfall. Yay, good job. <laughs> Yeah. If you get tired, have a piece of toast. Don't stay up too late. You got this.